Press one. All right, guys, I hate ads and you hate ads, so let's keep this under 10 seconds. Support Low Res Wonder Bread on Patreon and help us create brand new films, video essays, and series. Patreon.com slash Low Res. If, if you have the right pieces, uh, you do it well, and you know, we will succeed. We have now finally seen what a big screen adaptation of it looks like, and through this analysis deconstructed the making of the film from its point of origin to its theatrical release. If you followed this series from the beginning and have now watched Andy Muschietti's version of it, I hope that you found the evolution of that original screenplay to be both fascinating and enlightening towards the filmmaking process. When creative types set forth with an idea, it often winds up changing shape significantly as time passes. On a studio level, it is something that happens frequently and sometimes without want. Edgar Wright spent nearly a decade attempting to bring the Marvel Comics hero Ant-Man to the big screen, only to have the rug pulled out from him months before principal photography due to the dreaded creative differences. Creative differences were also the reason why Ron Howard was brought on board to direct the Han Solo Star Wars spin-off. In the original directors, Lord and Miller were booted weeks away from wrapping production. Kari Fukunaga had dedicated nearly four years of his life to Stephen King's It, from co-writing multiple scripts with Chase Palmer, to assembling a cast and crew, and even scouting locations. Yet the It we see today is remarkably different in many ways from Fukunaga's vision, in spite of his name occupying the screenwriter slot in the credits. His 2014 script was full of deviations from the book, from the petting name changes to character backgrounds, and his 2015 script took things a step further by reducing the number of losers to six and delving deep into the history of Pennywise. Once Andy Muschietti and Gary Dauberman came on board to helm the project and tweak the original script, every single one of those changes was reversed. But in spite of drifting away from Fukunaga's interpretation, there were plenty of ideas and even dialogue of his that remained in the movie. In the last part of this deconstructing series, I was rather critical of Gary Dauberman's revision, noting that the quality of the writing had noticeably declined between the 2016 version and Fukunaga's 2015 draft. Muschietti's uncredited rewrite of Dauberman's revision seems to have fixed many of the issues of that script and injected new life into the Stephen King property. By finding a balance between Fukunaga's desire to tell an adult tale using child actors and the core of King's seminal and, dare I say, heartwarming horror story, Muschietti crafted a great film that was one of the few movies to recapture that 1980s essence that properties like Stranger Things try so desperately to encapsulate. It could stand side by side with The Goonies or Stand By Me, and I don't think anyone could really protest. Most of Fukunaga's elements that remained intact can be found in the 2014 script. Mike Hanlon, the farmhand, Henry Bowers and his abusive father who works for the police force, the implied incestuous relationship between Alvin and Beverly Marsh, and some can even be found in the 2015 script, including my favorite scene of any of the drafts, which was discussed at length in part three. I won't spoil any of the hard details of it as I'm saving that for a review video, but the scene involving Pennywise preying on the children of the settlers in a flashback to 1625 is interpreted by Muschietti and implemented into the final cut of the film in present day. Instead of having a young settler in his grasp, Pennywise has, well, one of the losers. Instead of speaking directly to the child's mother, looking to make a deal, it's the other members of the Lucky Seven. Bill Skarsgård as Pennywise delivers the lines in such an authentically creepy way, and I can't help but note the fact that Muschietti, in rewriting the scene, rejected Dauberman's dialogue revisions and borrowed clusters of Fukunaga's original writing. There are other scenes like this which wind up differing from the source text, but spiritually are incredibly similar. Kind of like when comparing Fukunaga's later screenplays to it the novel. It branches away but retains the inner vibe that makes it feel so familiar. Fukunaga's fingerprints are all over this movie, and he's one of the many reasons why it worked so well as an R-rated feature. Moving forward without Carrie Fukunaga or Chase Palmer's presence, it'll be interesting to see where Andy Muschietti takes the property. We don't know much about Chapter 2 as of now, aside from the fact that it will have to distance itself from the novel even further in order to adapt to the 2019 setting and the alterations made in Chapter 1. In the book, the 1990 miniseries, and even the earlier drafts of the script, Derry is, on the surface, a nice little quiet town with a seedy inner demon in it. The Muschietti's Derry, 
Everybody is visibly scummy and corrupt to some degree or another. Mike Hanlon, originally the town historian who decides to stay behind and tend the local library, is already said to be a junkie and somebody who dabbles in psychedelics. Beyond that, we can only guess as to where the story will go, and wonder if the characters that survived in the book will be lucky enough to receive a similar fate in Chapter 2. This concludes Deconstructing Kari Fukunaga's It. But, you know, there was also that other unrelated draft, the one that squeezed the whole novel into one movie, and, well, maybe I'll actually save that for another day. Thanks for watching.